Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Growth RX Live. Today, I am thrilled to be joined with the amazing Tristan White. How are you, Tristan? Really well, Jade. Thank you. Nice to be here with you. Thank you, everybody, for joining in again for another Thursday from home. Uh, I'm Jade Scott. I think I said that at the very beginning. I'm, I'm losing it a little bit at the moment. Um, so, yeah, today to introduce Tristan in a little bit more detail, he is a dedicated leader first and foremost, an entrepreneur, physiotherapist, successful business owner, role model, super dad, author, I could keep going on and on and on. I've been watching Tristan's journey for a really long time, almost a decade, um, covering blogs, talks, uh, his book, The Culture is Everything, and now The Culture is Everything Club. So we've got a wealth of information coming your way, particularly around creating great workplaces and even more so great leadership and particularly in our space in the allied health industry but before we get started i've got a few hard-hitting questions for you tristan okay. just to kind of throw off the cuff what i would like to know is if you're going to have one person over for dinner who would it be and it could be past or present Right, yeah. Well, look, uh, if you were to ask me in the past, uh, Jade, I, I'm, a, I'm a big student of, of business and entrepreneurship. And so I would have given you a typical answer. And, and Richard Branson would be my, my, my first answer right there. But um, more recently, someone who's a, an inspiration of mine, someone I know, I haven't seen in a long time, is a, a lady by the name of Emma Isaacs. And Emma Isaacs leads business chicks, and she's based in LA at the moment. But um, Emma's now got six kids, and um, I would love to, uh, to have her over for dinner as well. Six kids, I certainly admire. I've, I've stopped at two and I think you've just had a brand new one in your family, haven't you? Yeah, we have. We're up to four and uh, I'm not sure we're going to make it anywhere near where M. Isaacs is up to six. There's no okay. I think that's another question. Up to four though, that's not a definite cap out. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, I, I think we're pretty firm on, on four. Uh, okay. and that, uh, that's and it. your wife is an osteopath, is that right? Well, she studied to be an osteopath. Yeah, she, 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 I, I met Kimberly when she was studying osteopathy and um, she, she hasn't progressed to practicing. She, she, she joined our business and she was a really important part of the early days of setting up our office and our support team and our accounts and all those sort of things. And now she's flat out as a, as a primary care or mum for she four little ones. having babies, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right, Jade. <laughs> okay, so question number two. Um, what's your favourite childhood memory? Mm. Uh, Jad, I grew up in a family with my mum and my dad and uh, an elder sister. And so it was a total of four of us. And my dad worked offshore. He worked in, the, in Bass Strait. Uh, he was a week on uh, at home and then a week off um, was when he was um, offshore in uh, between Victoria and Tasmania. And so my most exciting memories was the Tuesday afternoons when dad would come home. Uh, that was uh, it was a recurring rhythm of dad was away, which was pretty tough. But then dad coming coming back was uh, was pretty special. So I think those those Tuesday afternoons were pretty special, Jade. Yeah, nice. It's a nice memory. And the question I ask everybody in relation to footwear: Do you believe that Crocs are a legitimate form of footwear? I, I feel like I'm conflicted on this and answer, Jade. Um, I feel like I can get this question wrong. Is that right? You can get it very wrong, yeah. Yeah, right. I don't wear Crocs. I think that's the best answer I can give you, Jade. Okay, that's okay. And look, my, my follow-up question to that in, in becoming more serious is what does leadership mean to you? Now, we're going to explore that a lot over the next hour and we're going to dive into culture and leadership and, and what it means to you, myself and the community and our teams. But have you got a bit of a catchphrase or a quote that you love when you refer to leadership, something that is a bit short and sharp for us? Uh, I don't have a, a, a real firm um, belief or something that, that rolls off easily, Jay, but, but my response to that is leadership is doing the right thing, uh, true to your values, even when it doesn't seem easy or doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't, it's not easy to do. It's, um, it, it's, it takes, leadership takes um, braveness or courage. And so in short, leadership's doing the right thing that fits with your values, even when it's hard. Yeah, certainly. So your story, I mean, you've, you've been a physiotherapist, you are a business owner, you work a lot in aged care, your core values stream through constantly. Whenever we hear you talk, we hear you write, we hear you have huddles daily within your own community group. 
Mm -hmm. How did it all start out for you? I mean, were you, were you destined for greatness from a really young age? And one of the questions that I was going to ask you later that I'm going to skip to now is there's a lot of, of contention between whether leaders are born and whether they're made. What I want to know for you personally, do you believe you were born a leader? Did you have these qualities in you from a really young age? And can you think back to when your leadership journey started? Yeah, so the answer to the question is I don't think leaders are born. I think leaders are made. Uh, that, that's my um, very short answer to your question. And a bit more info on that is that leadership is, is a willingness to take on responsibility. Uh, and I reckon when, uh, when anyone, whether they've born into a family of natural, what people might say are natural born leaders, and that's where there's a lot of leadership shown in the, in the family, or someone who's uh, a 10th generation uh, employee um, sort of history, if, if you will, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a, a history of leadership. Um, I think if that person can take on a posture of responsibility for the first of their own life and then for other people, then, then we can find that we can step into this concept of, of leadership and leading others. And, and when you've taken that responsibility, it's a mindset, um, then there's so much to learn, um, both the, firstly the theory and then the practice and then the stuff ups and, and, the, um, and the learnings along the way. But the journey begins when, when a person takes responsibility for first of themselves and then other people, Jade. So I reckon um, leaders are, are made. I don't reckon it's a natural born leader. And, and look, that's, that's what you're trying to do with your Culture is Everything Club. I mean, you're, you're bringing in a community of emerging leaders, current leaders, you know, people who just want to do better and be better across all facets of their life, really. Take that into the workplace. When, when you first started the Physio Co, um, yep. what, what were you doing prior to that? I mean, were you, did, were you working as a practising physiotherapist first? Yeah, so so I my story goes a bit like this: that I grew up in a small town called Foster in South Gippsland, the most southeastern part of Victoria. Uh, I went to Melbourne Uni, started to be a physio, and I'm a dreamer, Jade. I love to dream and make plans about the future, and so I had this ten year sort of dream, if you will, that I'd finish uh, my physio degree, I'd uh, probably work in a hospital in the, in a hospital teaching hospital, progress to private practice, and hopefully one day. I'd become either a partner in or a, a busy practitioner in a, an elite sports practice was my real focus. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the mighty Richmond Tigers were going to need me to dash out on the MCG to, uh, to help them with, um, well, if they were playing the MCG, Jay, because they're not there right now. But um, <clears throat> that was my backstory and my dream. And then I finished uni and I, I sort of, I got a bit impatient, probably, Jade. I, I, I've, I'm impatient at times and I definitely was at that point. And I skipped straight to working in a, a growing group of private practices not far from where I grew up in the Latrobe Valley in Gippsland. And I worked in private practice uh, in a few practices and I worked with an elite under 18 sports team as a physio. Uh, but it turns out that despite that dream and that early career thought, I, I really didn't feel satisfied or, or I didn't feel like my heart was happy for helping athletes to run faster, jump higher, tackle harder. Uh, that was something that, that was a wonderful career direction for some people, just not for me. And I didn't get the great um, uh, satisfaction from it. So I reflected hard and I, I realized that despite, it was pretty embarrassing, Jay, because I told the world that elite sports, which is a sexy part of, uh, of the physio world for a lot of people uh, is where I was headed. But I realized working with older people, helping them stay mobile, safe and happy is what I loved. And so I got a 12 hour per week part-time contract job in a pretty smelly old nursing home as my first step towards building what has become um, a business based around helping older people. And so that's sort of the, the early part of the career, Jade. So from the footy field to beautiful elderly people and helping them move better and live better, which is probably, I guess, a reflection of your personality a little bit. I mean, nurturing people, you know, how much of your personality have you taken into your job and into your culture, which is kind of what we want to talk about next. You know, is, is your culture of your workplace, did it start off a reflection of yourself and your vision and then you've grown from there and then collectively brought other personalities and core values into that? Or is it still very much driven by your vision? 
Uh, it, it's definitely, um, it's leader driven. And that's the, the first part of the, the, the early part of Physio Co. Jade, I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I had this dream of helping older people and, and building a career for myself. That was where it started. And, and it, was, it was selfish. I, I really wanted a job that, um, that, that satisfied me. But I always had a dream that we would, I'd attract some other people would come and work together. And, and I'd be inspired by this smallish team. And I thought a typical health practice, which in my mind was, six to 10 people or, or, or thereabouts, Jay. That's sort of what I, what I had in mind. Um, and we sort of fumbled along for a few years. And then it was, I discovered this idea of a values-based business about five years into the Physio Co. And, and I read about it and I read every book I could. And I went and visited some values-based businesses and tried to understand it. And then I went through this process of discovering the core values of the Physio Co. And, and it was an iterative process where I got some other members of the team to help me out and to, um, to fine tune and, and to really be really clear at that, yes, these are the core values, not that we aspire to be, but really define who we are and what we're about. And we documented those. But then, Jade, in another pretty embarrassing moment, um, about six months later, after we documented these core values and shared them with the, the, our team and our clients and the like, is it, I realised that they were pretty dear to me they really were a reflection of me as the, as the leader um, as well as the business and and I was embarrassed at the time in, in on reflection of course it was like that's that's the the nature of how it works Jade but um but I think that's uh, leader driven businesses and founder driven businesses with core values um, we don't make it all about ourselves but we have to bring a whole lot of our authentic selves to um to our teams yeah and I think you know even for myself I, I, I resonate with you there a lot I was a a little girl with a big dream and opened a, a clinic in the western suburbs of Melbourne and you know always wanted to be you know the best clinic in Australia or even in the world and I think as you get older with professional maturity it's not about being the best it's bettering yourself every day and setting up an environment that helps others learn and grow and evolve so what I would like to know is how do you become you know, one of the 50 best places to work, if not the best, and three times Australian best workplace. How, how do you get, I mean, I know it's a title, but it also certainly means a lot. Mm. And how do you, there's a lot of grit, grind and gratitude that, that gets you to that point. The three Gs I talk about all the time. How do you get to that point? Because there's certainly a lot of hustling and hard work Mm -hmm. and dedication passion and obsession and then all of a sudden you're one of the best place, workplaces in the world where's the in-between part that a lot of people are watching mm. you know have to invest their time in if they've got that type of dream and vision yeah so so jade i think the concept of um here in victoria we call it little ats um or little athletics and in new south wales i think, I think it's called a little a's or, or thereabouts it's junior athletics and the concept of little athletics yeah my kids go to little ats and it's not about beating anyone else. It's about beating yourself. It's about learning the skills in discus and in shot put and 200 meters and 400 meters and 800 meters and high jump and keeping a record of how you did last Saturday and how you can do better next Saturday is the, is the concept. And that's how we've built the Physio Co to be very fortunate to be listed as one of Australia's 50 best places to work 11 years in a row, Jay. It's, it's unbelievable to think that that's been part of our story. But we did it by folk, by being the best uh, athlete at Little Aths, if you will, and that's comparing our own performance um, against uh, against what we did last year. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, in, at the very start, I, I was reading, flicking through a magazine, and I saw that there was an, an ad. You could enter your business in a third-party survey type of um, situation to get feedback from employees um, or team members, as as we know them. And and I'm like, yeah, I want to do this because. I'm the boss, I'm doing my better, very best to build the, the most trusting and connected team I can, but I feel like I'm not getting the, the most authentic feedback I could be from team members. If someone else can ask the questions, then that might help us out. And so I entered this, um, this survey or this workshop, it costs a bit of money in those days for, for a very small business. It might've been close to a thousand bucks, I think, which um, felt like a lot at the time, uh, but we got the, the uh, excuse me, we got the survey results, we got a, um, We've got the list of the questions as to where, how we did and what our team members had said. And some of it was pretty good. And some of it was room to improve. And we went to work on improving those things that weren't quite up to the mark as much as we could. And, and that's where we started from, Jade. 
What I didn't realize was that um, with that survey, they rang us up about a few months later and said, but, um, Tristan, did you know that by entering this, we're putting together a list of Australia's 50 best places to work and you're gonna be on the list. I'm like, that's absurd, uh, but we'll take it. And so that was the starting point. That's where it all began. And so then we continued to enter the process to get the results, to learn, to grit, to uh, using the grit to grind all those and then using gratitude to celebrate it um, is, is part of the story, Jade. So that's little ass is the answer to, uh, to becoming the best version of yourself in, in that sense. It is, it is one of the best analogies I have heard. Um, but a step away from that, I mean, positive culture, that's what we work towards. We constantly need to invest time in that all the time. There was a, a snip I actually wanted to show, which is Gary V, and you hear him say, you will never, ever, 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 ever get a healthy workplace. And he goes on and on and on. And I think part of that is because he says that you will never get there because you constantly have to be investing into it all the time. And most great leaders or leaders who really care about their workplaces and their teams know that this investment is constant. My question to you then is when you are leading and when you have a team surrounded by colleagues, we've got a lot of different personalities that come into play and personalities clash and people's core values actually clash as well. When you get, and I don't want to use the term toxic, but that's the best way to describe it. When you get a toxic mentality, mm -hmm. a culture can change very rapidly just by having one new member in that has maybe a different mentality. And whilst we've got a really thorough screening process, and that's one of the things I want to talk to you about next, so we'll put that on ice is your interview process. Yep. Um, you know, when you do get some negative vibes coming through, do you address that personally? Do you get your managers to address that? Is it done through peer, you know, peers not validating that type of behaviour? What's the best way that you would suggest to some workplaces if they come to you and say, look, I've got a really toxic, you know, team member, what's the best place to start here in, in changing that mindset? Yes. So, Jade, I think the, the, the concept that I've learned the hard way on this, and I, I've I've seen some behavior in our business that I wasn't pleased with um, and I didn't think fit our values and I, I didn't think it was respectful. And I've done uh, the, all the things along the way which don't work, like send a reminder via email to everyone that, we, that, um, that this is what we should be doing. It doesn't work. Um, what works is, is directly speaking to, to a person in an interested, curious and respectful way in private. Uh, we, we need to, we praise in public and we challenge or, or, or ask um, what could be perceived as uncomfortable questions in private. And if it's a member of my team, I've got a, I've got a five person executive team that, that is my um, team. And Jim Collins, Jim Collins from Good to Great, Jay, told us that we need to have the right people on the bus. Well, I reckon what I've learned more recently is we actually need to have a fleet of minibuses. And, uh, and all the leaders are the, are the, are the driver of, of a little minibus. And so I've got a minibus and it's my responsibility to make sure that I've, I'm leading a pocket of greatness in my minibus. And if someone on my team is not living the values and behaving the way that we expect them to, it's my job to speak to them privately and, um, and explain that I've got a challenge, but let them know what's going on. Um, maybe I've got the wrong, end, wrong angle or wrong side of things here and clarify if that happened is something in someone else's team and there are, there's a manager or a team leader that's responsible for that team, then it's their job to lean in and privately have that conversation. Um, and I need to make sure I hold them to account, but um, it is the leader of the team responsible in a private way um, to, to deal with that. That's my experience. Jane. Yeah. And I think, you know, you kind of do need to action it because you do have eyes on you. And if somebody's behavior is affecting other people in the group by doing nothing or not addressing it, you, you're kind of not showing leadership there by default either. So it, it is something that needs to be addressed, but exactly as you said, respectfully and, and usually behind closed doors. We don't need to air dirty laundry, but I, I'm, I'm loving all your analogies here, by the way. We've got <laughs> little athletics and now we've got mini buses. I'm going to yeah, start, yeah. I'm going to put them all together in a PDF for everyone at the end. Hey, Jay, just a, just a quick question on, on that. And that is if someone's not living the values, um, in my experience, um, it's, we often, as the leaders, we think it's work-related. Um, and I think we need to just um, keep ourselves to account and realise that a lot of people um, have got a whole lot of stuff going on in their lives, um, which can show up at work and can show up in behaviours that we don't 
realize or expect or give a, give them a, a um, give some thought to. So be human in the way that you connect with people and ask questions because it can be something significant happening outside of work, which is showing up in a work sense. And if they've got a difficult situation going on at home or outside of their work life, and then they show up at work and their boss starts giving them a hard time about work, uh, that it can blow up into something much bigger than it needs to be. So I think uh, understanding that it may not be specifically work related, we need to understand before we, we, we take any action is really important there, Jade. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, the extension of that is whilst we've got core values and mission statements that align with our workplace, we all as humans should have a personal mission statement. I, I know that I and I make my team quite often reflect on their own personal mission statement and core values. And if your workplace core values and your personal core values aren't aligning, then you're actually going to see that come out and you're going to see that through somebody reclusing or becoming, you know, not so involved, not so engaged, or maybe somewhat being a little bit more negative than they normally would be. Because it's really hard to suppress some of those emotions when they are so big in your personal life. Exactly as you said, you're going to bring them into the workplace. And I think great leadership recognises that. And so do great peers. It's not even about leadership. It's about just being a great team member. Mm -hmm. um, and so leading on from what I wanted to talk about before, the interview process, mm -hmm. it's really important. And I get asked this, this question a lot is there's some people that interview really well. There's some people that look great on paper. Are there any exercises or questions that you do that try and kind of weed out, you know, those people to see or, or scenarios that you might offer, or I'm sure that you offer analogies that, you know, help bring out a personality of not somebody presenting in an interview, but what they're likely to reflect when they come in and join that culture. Mm, it's really difficult, Jade. It's, um, when someone leaves a business, we know exactly what they're like at work. But when someone joins a business, we've got no idea what they're like at work. And that's the, this is the problem. We're making our best guess as to what they're going to be like when they, they come into, into our team or business. And, and it's, it's, it's a risk when you employ someone. There's no question about that. But I reckon the things that I've learned which uh, have helped to reduce the risk, if you will, that that person will be the wrong fit for your team or, or won't behave in the way that adds value to your team uh, is to have a, a multi-step recruitment process. And, and that is, it's not simply one interview type situation. There is multiple interactions with that person to get a feel as to what they're like in a non-interview, non on their best behavior type of, um, type of situation and have a multi-person process. And that is, it really shouldn't be only up to one person, whether a, a team member or a potential team member does join your team. I reckon if you can, it's difficult when you've got a small team, I, I, I understand that and I've been through it myself, um, but if there's a way you can have multiple interactions with people and call, if you've got an applicant or someone who's working through a recruitment process with you, I encourage people to interact with them regularly. We have to move quickly these days. It's, um, it certainly has been increasing speed required because there's this war on talent that we've been through. And I understand that COVID-19 pandemic has, has changed things in that sense in some ways, but I suspect we'll, we'll move back to, um, to a, a war on talent some, somewhat in the future. Move quickly, but communicate often because if someone knows you're going to call them at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, they're going to be ready for the call and answer it with, um, uh, hello, Tristan speaking, and, and be, be likely very professional and polite. But you ring them at 4.55 on Wednesday, and how they answer the phone uh, might just give you a little bit of a, a sneaky peek into how they might behave when um, people aren't watching or they aren't considering. So I don't, I don't say she, people should be um, uh, not authentic about this, but I think multiple steps and multiple communication um, the channels along the way is a really important uh, important concept there, Jade. Yeah, and and as you said, you know, shifting across and totally segueing to another subject, you did bring up COVID nineteen. It's very front of mind at the moment. We are amidst a crisis, and we are seeing some changes in cultures as a response. There are some some real polarizing of teams going on at the moment. There's people who you would assume would step up. They've risen to the occasion. They have embraced the change and, and they've really shown those great leadership qualities. And then I find in some businesses that I talk to, there's some people that, you know, you would think would come out and shine and rise to the occasion. And they certainly have been, I don't want to say disappointing, but I guess 
the perception of what one would think they would do has been the total opposite. What are you seeing with your experience in working with businesses at the moment in regards to what's going on in these teams? A lot of it is surrounded by fear and the unknown, safety and security, you know, they're, they're all of the things that are affecting our great needs as human beings uh, are being challenged at the moment. Is, is that why we're seeing this happen? And what's your experience with that? Well, I think, Jade, uh, as human beings, as, as much as we say we want variety and we, we want excitement in our lives and the like, I think at the heart of things, many people want certainty. Uh, and and this pandemic has realised that nothing much is certain in our lives right now. We, we, no, we didn't see this coming six months ago and we certainly didn't see the impact it's having on our lives. And so I think that's been a real shake-up for many people. And like I said earlier about leadership, um, we're all leaders in, in various ways, whether we lead a large team or we, we lead ourselves, um, a one-person team of ourselves. Um, but the thing is, uh, I think it's so important that people realise that when there's uncertainty or when there's, there's an opportunity, a space to step into, uh, some people will choose that as a responsibility and step up and respond. And that's what I've been seeing during this pandemic. And on the flip side, some people will see their work as simply a job. Uh, and the people that see their work as a, as, a, as a real responsibility and opportunity to contribute and be the best version of themselves, are the people that are emerging leaders in your team and are really value fits and culture fits for your team. People that say it's a job, it's not, I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm not saying it's, a, it's necessarily a problem. I'm not saying that it's any, it's human nature, but you can really see the people who step up in these times and certainty is something that we just have to get used to realizing that um, the only thing that's certain in our lives that things are going to change uh, and how we respond to that is, is the opportunity that we've all got. Absolutely. And it's a very stoic mindset. I mean, I love Ryan Holiday from the Daily Stoic. If, if anyone hasn't read some of his work, it, it's certainly at the top of my list. And even just getting some daily insights from him, this is not something that's new. You know, this goes way back to the ancient philosophers, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, all of those great leaders back then went through so many catastrophes in their life and went through so much hardship and it, it does get better and it does evolve but the unknown is you know i guess it, it's what drives fear and it what it's what makes us cling to our repetition and our routine and the things that bring safety into our life and i'm certainly struggling with that i think that's where covid fatigue is coming from and people throw this normal you know i want to even my five-year-old daughter she said to me yesterday morning, mummy, when do we get to go back to normal? Which I thought was a really interesting concept. And she talks about, you know, before the virus, before the virus. And it is heartbreaking to hear and to see a little girl's face who just desperately wants to go to the park. But she's such a do-gooder as well. She says to my husband, you know, put your mask on, daddy, put your mask on, daddy, and we're sitting in the car. So it, it is certainly affecting everybody, which is why, you know, I think you and I, we've got such a great passion for leadership and so many others do. What, what would your words be to some of the new graduates coming out in, in healthcare or just in life in general who says, but I'm not a leader? You know, I, I believe that everybody could learn from great leaders or look at working on their, you know, professional and personal development in this area. And you don't have to be the stereotypical confident loudest in the room to lead some of the greatest leaders we see are introverts and people with beautiful natures who just have people rally around them and we often don't even know why what what is, what is your words of encouragement to i guess a new professional who just says i'm i'm not a leader mm. Look, Jade, there's, there's a part of me that, that wants to lean in and, 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 dare I say, use the term educate, that we are all leaders of our own lives. But, but no, and that doesn't work. That, um, people only, uh, the, um, the teacher arrives when the student's ready, whatever the term is you might want to say. So there's a, there's a really powerful concept, and I think it was Carol Dweck who, um, who wrote, the, wrote, wrote about the power of yet. And, um, and I would simply respond to, the, uh, to their sentence that I'm not a leader, that they're not a leader yet. Uh, and, and with that in mind, there's, there's a great opportunity for, the, for them if they choose it and when they choose it. And there's a real chance that they will be. So I'd encourage them to 
uh, to observe other leaders and know which leaders you like the look of and the sound of and seem, seem useful to you and which leaders you like, oh man, that just doesn't resonate with me. Um, and we've got some polar opposites in the world at the moment. Uh, for, for example, here in Victoria, we've got Dan Andrews, who's uh, the Premier of Victoria, and he's leading in, in a way which is um, which is the way he chooses to lead. In, in I would say it's authentic to Dan. Um, on the across the ditch, we've got Jacinda Ardern, um, who leads New Zealand in a very, very, very different way to um, to how Dan Andrews does and other leaders around the world. And so, there is no one script or method to being a leader but I would encourage uh, younger people who aren't really there as a leader or don't realise they're a leader yet to, to think stuff, I'm not a leader yet, maybe, just maybe one day I will be, and therefore let's pay attention to the leaders around us so we can know what we think works, what doesn't work, and, and um, be aware of what's going on. And it, it's true, though. There's, there's many, many different leadership styles. I kind of break it down, and many people break it down, but there's, you know, you could go on and on, but there's four main ones, probably. We see the the problem solvers of the world, those that come up with technology, the innovators, the artificial intelligence. Then you've got the solution finders, the people that want to make everybody's life just easier by providing solutions, tools, comfort, all of those sorts of things. Your genuine entrepreneurs, your business people with grand ideas out who truly believe that they can change the world. And then you've got your modern day missionaries, people with the big kind hearts that, you know, their, their help is high, carers, compassion, all of those sorts of things. So, so it's not, you don't necessarily have to be all of them wrapped up in one, that you can choose your leadership style and then own it and then drive it forward. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I wanted to ask you in regards to, and I always call it the chicken and the egg, you know, we see a lot of entrepreneurs these days stepping into those leadership roles, mm -hmm. or is it that leaders innately by default become entrepreneurs just because of their nature what's what's your take on on that oh, i don't think leaders naturally become entrepreneurs i think there's many different types of leaders and there's and you can lead in a public um sense like politicians that we we mentioned and and i, I don't think that all politicians and leaders are um entrepreneurs uh similarly i think there's many other um, leaders within organisations, whether that's for profit or not for profit, health or not not health, that are wonderful leaders of people, but they're not necessarily um, the innovators or entrepreneurs that you speak of, like Elon Musk, for example. So I don't think leaders are nat naturally entrepreneurs. And similarly, I think entrepreneurs are technical, technically focused. They're looking at and sort of putting resources together and doing something different to what's been done in the past, and then probably creating it for profit. Um, that's what most entrepreneurs are doing. And I know there's, there's social enterprises and different, um, different models, but the entrepreneur who can then evolve into becoming a self-aware, um, effectively communicating leader, that takes a real amount of, uh, of effort. And that's something that I've been working through and I've got a long way to go, Jay, but, but from, I created something at the physio co or which was a job for me. And then it became a small team and then over time it's come, become a bigger team and I've had to learn how to be a leader of a team as opposed to the technician, the physiotherapist that I, that I was trained to be in the early days. And so um, in short, uh, leaders aren't naturally entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in my experience have to learn and work hard at themselves to become effective leaders over and can take a long time. Yeah. And with, with the physio co, what you did and you write it beautifully into your book in one beautiful page in culture is everything is you use, I think it's 19 steps to a great place to work. And you break that down into four subgroups. The mm -hmm. first one being discovering your core, which is what kind of we went through before your core values and all of that sort of stuff. Documenting your vision is the next part of that. How often do you talk about your vision or your 10 year plan with your team and do you revisit it constantly is, is it really important to do that as a leader is to talk about your vision and and not necessarily sell it but make others feel a part of that and feel like they're contributing yeah it really is jade so um co connecting um myself and everyone i possibly can with the future as to where we're headed is is one of the most important jobs of being a leader in my experience and uh, look, I've got a regular um, ways that I, we've got a bigger team at the Physio Co now, and so I don't see everyone every day, and especially in COVID nineteen lockdown, I don't see everyone. But a regular rhythm of communication, including um, daily huddles, is, is really a really significant way we do that. 
Um, I've got an, a, a personal email that I communicate to all of our team members every fortnight is the rhythm on that. Um, I've got Facebook Live within the group, the Physio Co Facebook group um, is something we do regularly so people can see the whites of my eyes and ask questions and, and, um, and we can really connect. But in answer to your question, um, everything that we do needs to be connected through to the purpose of the organisation, the vision as to where we're headed and or people living the values, which is helping us to, to slowly but surely add those one percenters, which will get us closer to bringing the vision to life. So the answer is as many conversations as you possibly can uh, get them in to um, focus on your vision and you'll get sick of talking about it. But when you're sick of talking about it, at the very least, it's, you're saying it often enough. And, um, but everyone else who's just hearing it for the first time or maybe the 10th time, you've got a hell of a long way to go. So talk about it, talk about it, talk about it uh, is my suggestion there, Jade. And then you talk about executing it relentlessly. Yep. It, it's, it's something that you do have to nurture all the time, even when you've got a great culture. And I've had my experience with this all the time. You know, you get, you get a beautiful workplace. I absolutely adore my team. Hello to anyone who's watching at Western Region Health. I genuinely do, hand on heart. My, the, the people, your success is only as good as the people around you. And to be able to give back puts a really warm, fuzzy feeling in my stomach. But it is constant. And it is, I don't want to use the word tiring, but when you're putting in an exorbitant amount of effort into something that you really, really care about, yes, you don't feel like you're working, but at the same time, it is quite a time-consuming venture and you do need to do that. I mean, how do you look after yourself? Well, you've got, you've got is it 75 employees? You know, I've, I've got near 40 and you're almost double that and yet I'm sure you know every single one of them by name. How, how, do, you, and how do you find the time to look after you and also invest into your team without getting that leadership burnout and that mm -hmm. business owner burnout. Jade, I'm a student of many people and many, many things, but um, in 2009 was a really critical year for me because I discovered a mentor of mine, his name is Vern Harnish. Vern Harnish wrote the book, uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits and the Second yes. Version of Scaling Up. And Vern has repeated to me and when I say to me, he's telling everyone, um, but to me, routine sets you free. Uh, and I've really embraced that concept of routine sets you free. Uh, and so by being as organized and having a rhythm of connection with our team members, like that fortnightly um, email I mentioned and like the daily huddles and like the regular in-person TPC swarm conference that we have, we've got this rhythm of connection, which enables me to connect I've also got a personal rhythm uh, that, that with our family and that I have at least one of every two, two one of every um, week, one week, I should say, of every school holidays off work. Uh, I make sure that I have that time to connect and to relax and to, and to sort of, I know, I guess, recharge myself. And so a rhythm of connection and a rhythm of rituals within a business is part of Execute Relentlessly. You've got to have them personally as well. And we've been working through this in the Cultures Everything Club uh, in the last month, Jade, of, of we can't lead others unless we firstly lead ourselves. And we can't lead ourselves unless we understand ourselves and our own rhythms that we do work through. So um, uh, I reckon block in the calendar at, at the, in December, Start thinking through the whole next year. When am I having time off? What am I going to do? Put yourself first so then you can look after yourself and then you can lead the team. It sounds hard. It sounds counterintuitive, but we, this is the long game. We've got to be able to do this for as long as possible. In my experience, the most important job of a business owner is to stay in business. And we can't stay in business if we don't look after ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the hardest things I find is not saying no to other people. I have to say no to myself. Yes. I've got so many things that I want to be doing and ticking off and checking off that I, I need to start saying no to myself first. I get so excited and commit to things and then, you know, you find after a, after a while it all does start to catch up. So it's great advice and I think we all desperately want a holiday now. I, I dream about sitting on in by the pool at in Bali next year with my family we just kind of need this COVID to go away so that you know I also don't want to chase happiness either I think you need to be happy in the moment too but I think there's a lot of us out there that sort of need a holiday but creating mini holidays within your team and and that validation and that constant recognition is really important what are some of the activities that you do with your team just the little things because 
you know, think big, act small as part of that process that you, you constantly is, is your mantra. What are some of the little things that we can do, not just as business owners all the time, because everyone needs to contribute to this. It's not hard for everybody to offer these little acts of random kindness around. And, you know, even we had a, we had a kindness week where one of the girls at work we just had to give little gifts or little notes. We all got nominated somebody, like, like a KK, but in the middle of the year. And it was really nice. What are some of the things that you do at the PhysioCo and your suggestions to other businesses that are just small enough but big enough to make a big impact? Uh, well, Dan, I'll give you a couple of quick examples in a tick. But firstly, make sure that everyone is empowered to do all those things as often as possible. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, it doesn't, you, you don't have to just have a gratitude week when the boss says there's time for a gratitude week. There's, um, we, we talked about having the, the fleet of minibuses, if you will, earlier on. And uh, there's, no, uh, there's no reason why the driver or the leader of said minibus could not have someone who's responsible for gratitude or, or for doing something fun every Friday Arvo or something like that. So I think um, realise that anything's possible. Yes, we've got a core purpose and we've got a vision. We've got, we've got to get the work done. But why can't we do it in a way that grabs a moment of time for, for gratitude or, or the like? So don't make it the job of, of only the boss. Uh, encourage people to catch people doing something right, have some fun and, uh, and show some gratitude as often as possible. Um, but in the moment, uh, Jay, with, with it, so, it is a, a tough time at the moment in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. I think the most important thing that we can do is take a moment to notice how other people are. Uh, I think we spend so much of our time at the moment thinking about ourselves and our own family, our own work, our own clinic. Um, but I, I'm doing my very best to, to notice whether it's through the, the lens of the camera like we're doing right now because we're having a lot of Zoom meetings or when I see someone in person or I see their email or their text message, does it sound like them? Or does it sound like someone who's on edge and who's not quite themselves? And if so, what can I do to pick up the phone to not create more anxiety, but how can I connect with them and say, what's going on? How can I help you? What's the most important thing that's, um, that we can do right now? I think being the most human person you can be um, is really critical, not only now, always, do it all the time, but, um, but I think that's one of the most important thing we can do. And secondly, Jade, um, give, allow people the space if they need a... I'm personally having next Monday off. Um, I spoke to my, my leadership team this morning and said, I reckon I need a day just to, to recharge next Monday. Um, is there anything happening that, um, that, I need, that I'm going to miss? They said, no, nope, sounds good to me. And so next Monday, I'm, I'm off um, from the physio co. I think we have to be as, um, as human, as, as understanding as that, Jade, is just some of the stuff we can do. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and on a bigger scale from that, you talk about having a generous social budget and all of those sorts of things. And, you know, we, we, we take lots of photos. I think having that memory bank and a, a library of things, even for the next people that come in, and you, you talk very much about that initial induction and mm -hmm. the welcome into the clinic and showing people, hey, you just joined us, but this is what we're really like. And then the integrity to follow through. And not just have a hey big welcome day with lots of balloons and cake and then it never ever happens again it's again that executing relent relentlessly and then following through constantly and you, i think you talked about it you touched on it a little bit before in that it's not always the role of the leader for these gratitude days do you actually delegate gratitude and i know that that sounds silly because it should be something that comes naturally but do you actually delegate that off to then other leaders to make it their responsibility to make sure that it is consistent? Mm. Do I delegate gratitude? I don't think I delegate, but I think I, I think we, we make a choice to make gratitude as abundant as it possibly can be. And that is that, um, and that is that, yes, it is my job and I'm expected to, um, to write on a birthday card and an anniversary card for, for members of the team that I'm responsible for. And yeah, it's part of the job of the other leaders to do little rituals like that in a personal handwritten way to acknowledge the, the anniversary of a person who's been working in our team or clinic for one year, two year, 12 years, whatever it might be, and to acknowledge their birthday and or if they buy a house or they finish a course or, or whatever they might do. Uh, so we, it's part of the core values of the Physio Co that we celebrate milestones and successes. Um, it's inbuilt into our core values and we're expected to live by those behaviours. And so, yeah, I guess there is, you might say it's delegated. I, I would say it's promoted. It, it, it's what we do. Yeah. 
And you do that. I mean, we do that even amongst patients. We've got VIP patients. We give them gifts. Uh, we give them, you know, special promotions. I think I, they all got a golf umbrella last year and I'm just about to get coffee mugs done for, you know, people love to be validated and they love to be recognised and feel like they matter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the greatest gifts that we can give somebody is to make them feel like they matter and then therefore we kind of matter in return. It's just this, it's, it's a beautiful cycle that I think would, you know, make life a lot nicer, really. But, you know... I think from doing that with patients right through to doing that with team members, making it sporadic, you know, as soon as something becomes a little bit repetitive, as we were talking about offline, it starts to become assumed. And, you know, one of the things that I don't like to use the word trigger because I like to be controlled of my emotions and I think temperance is, is a great value to have. But I think entitlement for me is the opposite to gratitude, which is what everything, everything I believe in. And entitlement comes from assumption and expectation. So if, if somebody starts to assume something to be given to them, then all of a sudden to not get it makes them bitter and twisted and feel like, I shouldn't say twisted, bitter and feel like they're going without. So it's not my place to suggest why I get bitter about who's deserving of things and who aren't and why, who's entitled to things and who aren't. But it's a lack of gratitude that comes with entitlement because the two cannot coexist. It's like a coin toss when you've got heads or tails. You've got entitlement or gratitude. You can't truly appreciate something you genuinely believe you're entitled to. So how do you get around that sense of entitlement at work when people just, you know, I, I want this holiday in January and I'm entitled to time off or you know, I'm, I want my bonus at Christmas. I'm entitled to that. I've had it for three years running. Mm. Is it, I mean, look, I, I'm talking very broadly here, but, you know, how do you deal with that? Look, Jade, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot in this and it's, it can be tricky and we could, we could go back to your daughter and my children who desperately want to go to a playground right now and they feel entitled to go to a playground. Um, and there's, but then we can also talk about how, um, as business owners, we sometimes think that money and financial rewards are the things that speak the most to our team members. And, and I can tell you from years of experience, both research and, um, and leading a team, is that we, money is important. There's no question money. We, we all need money to pay our bills and to support our families and, and to, to feel a certain level of, of worth, if, we, if you will, in our professions. Um, but recognition is where the real, uh, the real magic happens. Um, but by the same token, if someone thinks they're going to be recognised for the great work they do every Friday or every second Wednesday, then it completely loses um, uh, its effect. And so recognition, when recognition is deserved, uh, is, is a really important thing. And we have to be leaders that catch people doing something right and, and notice people. And then in the moment, we have to mention it. And we have to become good at storytelling, I reckon, and in storytelling as to why that person, you're giving them a pat on the back for what they did, how it fits with the core values and then how it contributes to the vision or to the future it is the real magic or the real method that I think we need to do, um, Jade. So uh, I think there's, there's a whole lot in this topic of entitlement and, and gratitude. But I think if we can be um, gratitudists, if that's the right language that, yeah. um, that, that I use there, Jade, uh, catch people doing something right. And the, my last suggestion on this topic is that if someone comes to me and says, look, Tristan, I really need to change my hours. Um, I've been working um, Tuesday afternoons, but now I need to pick up my, my daughter or my son from, from school at three o'clock. I just can't, can't, I need to change that shift. And my response used to be, uh, fine. Uh, and, and then I'd scurry back to my desk or computer and like, how the hell am I going to solve this? Um, and, and then what I've learned to do is to say, I get it. I've got a family too. I understand. We've also got these um, at the physioco. We've got these senior clients. We want to help them to stay mobile, safe and happy. Um, you want this time off. We've got these clients. We want to um, help to stay mobile, safe and happy. How can we figure this out together? And I encourage people to work together and ask, you know what? You can definitely have Tuesdays Arvo, or Tuesday Arvos from three to five off, but can I please grab those two hours back on Thursday mornings um, so that we can reschedule those clients or the like? And it doesn't work perfectly, Jay. It doesn't always work. But for the right people who've got a responsibility for, for their work, um, that's the way that I, I suggest we try and manage those conversations. 
Yeah. And I mean, empathising with their situation and then coming up with a compromise of some kind together so that, you know, both parties are, are okay is, is certainly what it's about. And I, you know, our practice manager does an amazing job of that. And often I find we've, we've got this analogy at work of, you know, don't attack the parking inspector. Often, often the practice managers or managers that are just following through on policy and procedure, just like a parking inspector puts your ticket on the car if you've parked in the wrong spot, they don't get or deserve the abuse that comes with that. If you've got an issue, you write a letter to cancel the person who put the sign up in the first place. So it is, it's about that communication and, and give and take and all of that sort of stuff. But as you say in your book, show more love. You know, it resonates with me so much as a gratitudist, but to hear other people show more love, you know, there's, there's so much that we can do. And I think if we all commit to giving more than we take, then it's just going to be a beautiful multiplication effect of, of all of that. But it, it is hard and we are all human and workplaces don't have to be perfect. And certainly you get your little grumbles in the staff room about having to work Saturdays and all those sorts of things. You know, we, you, you, there's a difference between contributing to a negative culture and having a bit of a vent. And I think nipping it in the bud, either one there before it escalates too much is probably the key. Yeah, yeah. Look, it really is, Jade. It really is. And then Jade, just a, just a comment on, on that is that um, you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk or Gary Vee earlier. And there's plenty to like about Gary V, and there's plenty to not like about Gary V. Depends on what topic he's um he's talking about. But there is one concept I think that all business owners need to be aware of, and Gary V talks about this often. And that is that employees or team members, as hard as they're going to work and as committed as they're going to be, they're probably not going to work as much and as hard and be as committed as what the owners of the business or the clinic is. And and we can create create an environment where there's a great alignment, a great commitment. And, and But by the same token, the owners have got everything on the line and we have to be aware that, that that is our job, that is our responsibility as the leaders and the owners. We can encourage people, but expecting people to give as much as the owner, I think, is, uh, is a situation that you're going to be let down pretty re regularly, Jade. Absolutely. And with, with assumption comes disappointment. If you assume something to be a certain way and you've got it set in your head and you, you've got it all planned out how it's going to work out and it happens to not go according to plan, that's where we get disappointed. So I think, you know, rather than make assumption and expect things to go a certain way, act on it yourself or assume that people, you know, have their own right to do what they want and people get to live their own best life as well. So... Look, in summary, we, I could sit here and talk to you about culture for ages, but, you know, what you, what you try and do, and I know for a fact from hearing many other people, it's an absolute credit to you, you have changed many workplaces out there just with these simple philosophies and things that people can action and put into play. And it is genuinely about caring about other people. But the reality is, and the evidence is there to support it, it, it is not an accident that these big corporations have so much money that they invest into culture. The evidence is there. Better culture has better efficiency, better consistency, you know, better engagement from their teams, better retention of staff. The, the amount of evidence to support that a healthy, positive culture brings a much better workplace and better results for everybody, including the consumer, the patient, you know, what, what would be your three take-home measures that somebody who was starting up their own business today and had maybe a team of about three or four, so just starting a bit of a workplace, the vision that you talk about, that 10-year vision and reverse engineering that backwards, what would be your advice to them in creating the foundations of a culture? Look, Jay, there's, uh, you, you mentioned the Culture is Everything system, um, which is in the Culture is Everything book, and that's got the four parts of discover the, discover the core, document the future, execute relentlessly, and show more love. Have you got one handy you can show us? Oh, uh, it's one. Just... Yeah. <laughs> People have yours, haven't you, Jay? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm promoting this book because it's amazing. Oh, no, the new one. Can we see the new one? Oh, yeah, there you go. It's um, with... Uh, yes. There you go. It has got the, the, I don't think yours has got the, um, the stamp on no, there. No, no. Mine's about six years old. Collector's oh. edition. Yours, Jade. Um, but Jade, what I was going to say 
I deal with those four parts. Um, in my experience, you do need to systematically move through and, and put them all into place. But if you're gonna, if you've got a small team and you want some quick wins to really just build some momentum, head straight to the show more love section. Um, as I throw a pencil around, but um, the show more love section is where the quick wins, the the way to connect with your small group of team members really is, and that's where the action is. And if you can build a rhythm of connection through these show more love type of actions. That, sell, that capture the memories, that celebrate the good times, be human enough to realize that it's not gonna be good times all the time and, and have a, a budget, whether it's time or money available to just realize bad stuff's gonna happen in the lives of your team members and their families from time to time and be accepting of that sort of stuff, then start there would be my suggestion. Um, I'd then encourage you to go back to the start of the system and consider what is your core purpose, what are your core values and where are you headed? Um, they really are the, that's sort of the, I'll refer to show more love, then discover the core and document the future as the three places to head for, um, for a team member or a team leader or business owner who wants to build a great place to work and a sustaining business, which will serve them and serve their team for a very long time. Amazing. And so before I let you go, can you, if, if there's people who are watching who want to hear more and read more about what you're doing, where, where can they find you? I mean, you've got tristanwhite.com. And an amazing podcast. So if people are podcast listeners, um, Jade, pick up their phone right now if they're not got in their hand already and, um, and go and search for the Think Big Act Small podcast. I think that would be, uh, if you're a podcast listener, listen to the Think Big Act Small podcast. Um, and if you spend more time on Facebook, then head over to the Tristan White Facebook page at 1.03 p.m. most weekdays, except for this week, Jade, you got me in a, in a timeout from timeout. Um, but I have something called the Timeout Live Daily Huddle. It's a short, sharp 12 minute um, live video that's on Monday to Friday, 1.03 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'd love for you to join me over there to get a quick um, check in and a quick burst of, of energy that um, hopefully I can help to serve you as you lead your team as well. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. It, you know, I feel honoured to talk to you. I, I, I almost feel a little bit celebrity struck here. I've been following your work for such a long time and now to be sitting on a call, talking to you, having you and invite you to the Growth RX community is, is really, really humbling for me. And it's certainly solidified my passion, my dreams and where I'm headed and delivering this sort of content and introducing people like yourself who are doing great things in leadership and healthcare to help so many people. Thank you so, so much for your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to more people connecting with you over the coming months and see where we're headed with the Culture is Everything Club, which I think is amazing as well. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thanks, Jade. Thanks.